If you find an excuse in the world of something that's making you unhappy and you choose and you're already unhappy about something, you will use that thing as an excuse to validate your unhappiness. Ignition sequence start. Three, two, one. Nathan Laka, what's up, dude? dude I'm going to come across it's for the handshake. It's funny. One time I did that and the water went flying. Everything goes flying. Yeah, I'm surprised Jared lets us. That's, uh, that's true escaping velocity. This is true, man. <laughs> Jared's so trustworthy with his electronics on this table. We'll see We'll see uh, how far we get. Um, so, Nathan, what's the latest, man? What are you up to? Man, you know, I, I it, podcast is doing well. Yeah. Uh, I need to do a better job. Is it to the top? Well, so I changed it actually. So I called it the top podcast because of okay. SEO purposes. Okay. When I launched it, I looked at what the number one search term was for podcast, and it was the top. What's the top podcast, dude? Are you serious? Yeah, that's the only reason I named it the top. Is an SEO because I couldn't play. understand because it's all sassy stuff. But yeah. The top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just an SEO play. Wow. Yeah. So I just switched it actually. So we we passed ten million downloads, and I said I should just make it what it is. Ten million downloads. Yeah, yeah, man. That's really that's crazy. Cool. Yeah, but yeah. I, you know, it took. It's not easy. You know, is I it don't, four years. Yeah, I was gonna say it took four years daily. Consist daily. Daily, fifteen to twenty minutes. I mean, it's not easy. I think there's a lot of people thinking about getting in the podcast space, and you do this great with all the videos you put out. Like, you have to kind of commit to like doing something. I, I, I said ten years. Yeah, every with week. no views. You'd have to be happy doing it with no views. Well, hopefully, one. My mom has to. Yeah, watch. and Renee. somebody has to watch <laughs> Renee. Hopefully, but yeah, it's. I mean, that's the thing that's been impressive uh, is the consistency. Um, so you've got that. The magazine we were just yeah, talking yeah. about. You know, hustling getting that out, hustling them, which I mean, again, it's it, uh, great investors say you have to believe in something that everybody else thinks is wrong yep. and be right. Yeah. How's the magazine been working out? Yeah, dude, I'll share the economics with you. This is crazy to me because I, I thought it was just going to be a loss leader. I would like kind of lose money on it, but I compared it to like the book. So the book would retail for $21.99. The magazine I now sell for $29 bucks, plus there's a $79 Excel file upsell where you get on the, the book online, there's a funnel. Uh, on the, the on the magazine. On the magazine has a funnel. It has a funnel. Got it. Yeah. So we start off at seven bucks, and then I couldn't ship them profitably. So I said, let me just try twenty nine bucks, and uh, we we do great. I mean, we sell probably about a thousand of them a month, and then we sub that that twenty nine grand subsidizes another nine thousand that we send out free to addresses of CEOs that and I have. And the upsell is a spreadsheet of the data. Yeah, it's basically what what I saw people doing was VCs that go into their office, they'd have my magazine out, and said, Nathan, every they time give I, it to an assistant. And yeah, like, they put hired that in me. Our spreadsheet. And oh, so there's literally gosh. someone there sort of typing the raw data I printed into Excel file. I'm like, oh, I'll just upsell that for 79 bucks. And literally it says, save your VA really? <laughs> for Excel work. Here, click That's here to get the copy the raw on the data. page? Yeah. Brilliant. So we convert about 43% of people that buy the magazine upsell. So the average cart value on that checkout page is about 60 bucks on a magazine. So it's very profitable, way more profitable than the book. That's crazy. Yeah. And because with the book, you went through a traditional publisher, you really don't, you got to pay almost retail, right? It's like 20% less. Maybe. Yeah. You can get wholesale. I mean, the way, uh, the way, the way you make money on a book is you get, you want to get a nice big advance yeah. right up front. And, uh, so we got a healthy advance and that made it worth my while to do everything. But then, yeah. you know, you negotiate to get it into kind of airport shops. Then you track the sell through right there. And then I'll call up the airport shops and go, listen, the book's selling great. Like I'm going to yank them off from the airport shelves unless you give me a discount on magazine placement and the books in the, in the airport. Really? So you start to leverage like these assets, this brick and mortar, old school, me old media assets. So you've got magazine, podcast, podcast started, magazine, book. The book is about capitalism. So it's interesting, yeah, yeah, like yeah. watching, and I know we talk a lot offline about like, um, you know, here's what I started, here's where I'm pivoting, here's what I'm doing. Um, Walk me through kind of like, because, you know, you're, you're also a controversial dude. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. You don't mind as we talk about No, not at okay, all. You cool. should put all this out there. All right, cool. Yeah, anything um, I've told you privately, if you're comfortable sharing it, I'm comfortable hearing it. I appreciate it. it. Just because, yeah, yeah. like, I always, people are like, what do you think of Nathan? I'm like, here's the deal. You follow him online. I know you have a perception of him. I know him personally. He's a good dude. But if you don't get a chance to sit down with him, sometimes if you just consume the, the public stuff, especially certain channels, you're not yeah. going to get the full picture. Um, but let's let's just talk about, like, your focus early, how's that morphed? What are you doing today? Like mm -hmm. in regards to content production, cause dude, you even did the Facebook uh, food truck stuff yeah, yeah. that led to a TV show yeah. that you shot, but didn't get picked up or yep. didn't get bought or somebody changed jobs. I mean, there's it's, and, and that's the other thing I tell people, you can't bet against Nathan. 
Well, I, I'll just I'll out You're hustle. You're rising star, bro. I'll, like, I'll, I'll out hustle anyone. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, I'm slightly sweating now because you know, before this, I was out hustling. You know, doing magazine distribution, but magazine like, drops. But like you guys, yeah, I was can, like, dude, there's a volunteer. You guys, process. I don't know if I'll you can see you on my fingertips here, but they're like jaded from all the Paper mag, cuts, like flipping through like all the mag. Yes, I mean, so like. And we were talking about, like, I'm probably too cheap in that regard. Like, I need to, like, hire some people. Leverage. But I'm horrible with people, man. I mean. There's a lot of people that want to support you, though, man. They can, I know, you I just know. Gotta, you just got to give them permit, like, ask. Yeah. And then, I mean, look, to your point about, like, online versus in person, um, you know, I, I kind of feel like I have a secret with anyone who knows me in person um, because they know, like, my energy, like, they've hugged me. They've like, they know I'm a good dude in person. Yeah. And so they almost become for anyone who like, doesn't, hasn't met me. And they'd be like, Dan, I saw you like, we're at a conference with Nathan, but like, man, that guy seems like a, you know, butthole. If you'll watch him on his podcast, he's so mean to people. And you're like, dude. And then you, you almost feel like you both have a position and now you're all that matters is you're talking about me. Right. So like th what I've learned is you want to move people. If everyone has a 50% view of you, you want to move as many people to 1% and as many people to a hundred as possible. You want to get them out of the middle. Polarize. Polarize. So you would be, cause we know each other, we're friends. I'd say, you know, you're 90, hundred percent, you know me, you know, I'm a good dude, but everyone else who only knows me maybe online, I really want them to hate me so that when they see and it's you, so, I mean, I just don't get it. I get it. Well, We've it's talked not for everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I mean, I mean, things like, uh, I don't know the whole political landscape, but I think you did a TV spot or whatever, yeah. and, you're, and you're talking about capitalism, and, and, and I know you say things to get people going. Yep. Um, I guess just from a personal brand, like, is it because for those people that are resonating with that message, they're gonna, they're gonna love you more. Like yeah. how does like, and then, you know, I always talk about invisible doors. Like if, if you do certain things and I'm not saying this is you, but there are people out there that, you know, behind closed doors, they, they don't act right mm -hmm. or whatever. And like these invisible doors close on them and they don't even realize it. Are you, is that a concern? Because if you're like trying to do deals with, you know, like you're dude, you're an investor, you're an entrepreneur, yep. you work with VCs, private equity firms, et cetera. Is there a concern that you're gonna be you're gonna be led down to say something that all of a sudden it's gonna cause you some some friction there? So I think this comes with confidence, right? When I launched the podcast, the way I got my first guest is I just said we will have a million downloads by the end of the summer. But I said it with such confidence, what people heard was this guy already has a million downloads. I want to go on a show. Mm -hmm. So then I got sixty pre-recorded and then emailed everyone and said, This hey, is that future living stuff. We yeah. Were so about. like my point is though is like, uh, yeah, yeah, you and you teach this, yeah. right? You teach this. And we were talking the other day about the right way Toronto's to do it. And we work yeah. and what's appropriate and what's not. But yeah. I think the point there is most people will never make that statement launching a podcast from nothing because they're going, wait, I don't want to tell everyone I'm like a, mil a million views and then not get a million views. Like, I, I, what, what's that going to say about me, right? Mm. I just have the thing is if you put it out there yeah. and then you work really hard, like it's going to happen, man. Speak your future. It's going to happen. Existence. You got you to put yeah. it out there. So yes, at some point, maybe someone will say, Nathan, I saw you on CNN or Fox and you said something politically that I don't agree with and they get in a big huffle puff about it. You know, if someone sees me in that one aspect and makes a snap judgment like that, it's probably not someone I want to have a long-term relationship with anyway, because they did no diligence to try and actually get to know me and maybe why I said I like capitalism or over socialism or some yeah. whatever statement I made. Yeah. So I'm not hugely concerned about it. So what I, I what I'm hearing is the confidence side is you're okay saying things. Is it because you know, give me enough time, I will win, and anybody that I want to do deals with, they have like because that that's what I see is like you've got the data set so it's like certain people even if they're they feel like um they might not align with a comment and they don't know you will still move forward to at least have a conversation because you also are winning is that like yeah I mean it's, I think it's for me um because it's you, like success it's like if you're the tallest building in the city like regardless what you think of me there's like, a shadow. Yeah, like people people are like Gary Vee, blah, blah, blah. He's to this, he's to that. But you can't deny, you can just publicly look at his number, let alone his track record. You have you to pay attention. Yeah, so what do you just like, if he's like, if he reaches out to you to co-invest in a deal, you're going to say no because of his you don't like much swearings. Yeah, 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 like yeah, yeah. no, you're not because he he's a guy that gets stuff done, done. right? Yeah, yeah. I, Is that I, the way you think about it? 100%. Yeah, so you're going to win. You're going to build. You're going to say these things and you're going to do it. And you just trust that the right people are going to be cool. Correct. And by the way, what, this is what people miss. It's actually way cheaper 
you know, people spend millions, hundreds, billions of dollars to, to make people love you, right? Okay. Yeah, advertising. It's way cheaper to make people hate you. you. Like you make one statement that you really believe in that like maybe you filtered for your whole life and you finally have the confidence to say it, but it's something you really believed in. And a lot of people start hating you for it. They're still watching. And if you're selling sponsorships, it's, it's fascinating, man. You know, it's your CAC on haters is cheaper than your CAC on lovers. Man, I'm, I'm not there. I don't like, I, you <laughs> know what I mean? Style. Like, no, I'm good. It's I'm not your saying. style. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm not there, but like, I think one time you were telling me about like the Mixergy thing, like <laughs> you wanted Andrew. Dude, he didn't want to do it. Yeah. You're like, dude, write this like really aggressive headline against me about like why I'm at, what, what was it like? Yeah. He, he wanted to do something really kind of fluffy and nice. Andrew's yeah. a great guy. I mean, my, such a good dude. He's one of the first people I listened to in yeah. the startup world. Yeah, 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 for sure. And I was like, Andrew, like I'll come on the show, but it needs to be like a bold, aggressive headline. He's like, well, what about this? And it wasn't strong enough. I said, <laughs> say, is Nathan Latka a bold? Uh, artist. That's what I want the headline to be. And he used it and it gets so many clicks. If you type Nathan like on Google, it's one of the top results. So everyone who really doesn't want to like me clicks that article because people click on what they agree I know with. It, I know it's traffic generating because like all these affiliates, you see them like, is this program a fake. scam? Yep. Fake. Does it, you know, do, and then, then it's this incredible copy of like convincing. Yeah. Them. They get you here and then they walk <laughs> you through and by the end you're like, you want to hate them. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> Oh, this could work. It's yep. so I get that people click cause that's, that's where they're at. Right. It's like chocolate broccoli, meet them where they're at, mm -hmm. give them what they need. Um, I've never heard that chocolate broccoli. I use it all the time in marketing. I love I think, that. You know, especially Especially with products, people are like, but it does this. I'm like, yeah, but your customer's not there. This advanced crazy stuff, that's what you know they need, but they're trying to buy this. You got to meet them here and then you get permission to give them what they need. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I like but that. I mean, it's, it's, you're just, it's, you, you understand the human psyche. Um, in regards to the things you're working on, I mean, you're, I actually read your book, which is fascinating. If people have yeah, not, oh, nice. yeah, if people have not, I have this whole uh, shelf. Dude, you're busy. I'm shocked you had time to I do One in. thing I do read is I just queue, queue up books because I just, dude, I remember when I first started reading, like I was, I was just in awe that people wrote these incredible books. And then I remember somebody gave me, I think it was Keith Ferrazzi in uh, Never Eat Alone talks about like, you should email the authors because mm -hmm. most people don't. Mm -hmm. So I started emailing authors and I was like so giddy back when I was in my early twenties that like they wrote back with thoughtful, you know, because they're, they're writers. I'm like a five word emailer. Yeah. They're like 200 words. Yeah. And then, uh, and then slowly, but surely friends of mine started publishing books. So I have a whole shelf at my house. That's just friends. So you're books. a physical guy, not a, not a Kindle guy. I read on Kindle. I buy the physical read on Kindle. buy the physical. I always read the book. I want to read it on Kindle cause it travels better and it saves my shoulder mm -hmm. carrying around books in a backpack. Um, but I love to buy it for the for the library. Interesting. Yeah, I want to see it. I want to remind because I feel like it's like a signaling when I see it. It reminds me of like, oh yeah, there was this thing. Tactic. But back to your book, it's very actionable. Yeah. Like, dude, you didn't write this. You know, let's. You know, it's not a theory. Anyway, no, no. There's none of these books. It's like <laughs> whatever. You guys have all read them. It's like this simple concept, and it's just story after story. It's like you literally give them email templates, tax returns, um, process steps. Mm -hmm. I mean. You know, a very reminiscent to a four hour work week. Yeah. Um, how has that feedback from the market? Again, I don't understand why did you write that book versus a SaaS financing book or like, how did you decide to do that specific book? So the book deal actually came along because uh, publishers were putting their business authors on my podcast during book tours yeah. and they saw me move and volume. what's the title again? I just uh, how to be a capitalist without any it. capital. Yeah. And what's funny is when I go on liberal TV stations, they'll use without any cap author of without any capital. But I go on conservative ones like Fox, and they'll use author of how to be a capitalist. That, like to my <laughs> mind, it's just be a capitalist. The, I think it's a blue jacket yeah, with yeah, your yeah. face on it. Yeah. yeah. But okay. it's funny you give a headline and people hear what they want to hear. Yeah. Right. And that's what they feed out. But back back to your uh, back to your question, that book deal came along because publishers knew I could sell. They had no idea if I could write. This comes back to your product that you teach. Like distribution sometimes is way more important than the product. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of great products that never see the light of day because of horrible distribution. So uh, the, bo the book to me was like a board game. I'd seen Ryan Holiday and Tucker right there in yep. Austin. Like do these, I'm like, let me see if I can do a book. And my biggest fear was I was gonna, you know, get a big advance, which we got a great advance, but that I was gonna sell a lot of copies and it was gonna be a bad book. But thankfully- Your biggest fear was you knew you could sell the copies, but is this a good book? Exactly. I Got wanted it. to make it actionable. So we actually engineered the book for airport bookshelves. In other words, if you pick it up and you flip to any page, there will either be a bold headline or a screenshot that's designed to suck you in. And that's why I did the short story format over and over touching 
podcast Everything. sponsor fees, LOIs I failed on, failed Well, I don't think people realize, like, you actually deliver on the promise. Yeah. I tried. I really tried. No, like, if you, if because you know how it is. It's like people, you can give them the freaking checklist of templates, and it's just like, just, they won't do it. Yeah. You've given them all that, and the process, and to deal with the objections, and they just got to do it. Sorry, I keep interrupting. I just find I find it fascinating that people continuously like they want to learn the how, but they're just not the doers. Yeah. But you wrote this book. How does it fit in the world of Nathan Latka's brand? Um, or was it just a, an experiment? Well, it was to see like how many. It was really. It was a board. It's like, do you play Settlers of Catan or like I'm, any of I'm you guys weird, play board dude. games? I don't play. No, yeah. not at all. I'm weird. I don't watch team Poker? sports. I'm weird, man. I, I that's where I find time to read. I literally just talk about business. So nothing, business. nothing competitive. N- sports, other, board games. Nope. Don't watch team sports. Gosh, amazing. I know. I just lost like half the listeners. Well, I'm a Redskins fan, so like I, I wish know. I didn't. I watch. Team. Yeah, I, know I you, wish I wasn't yeah. a Redskins fan. Oh, it's, I, <laughs> I don't know many, man. <laughs> oh my! I've been to. I think it was a Redskins <laughs> in Ohio. Uh, t- I don't even know who the team was. My only NFL game. I viewed the book though as a board game. Okay. Like there's old media, there's these authors that are very academic, ex PhDs to do, and then there's these people that put out like sometimes kind of slimy ish, you know, books that are really just like click here on my affiliate link to go buy my product. And what I want to do is kind of, you know, really mix it up. I really respected how Tim wrote Four Hour Work Week in terms of he included so many scripts and things. Gra- incredible book, yeah. Really good book. But uh, it you know, had been updated in 10 years. And so I thought there was a real opportunity to jump in and talk about that. And, and I talk about real hand experience, off, yeah. handoff. Yeah. yeah, so it did well. We just passed 25,000 copies sold, That's hit the legit, Wall Street man. Journal bestseller list. And people, we put it all up actually for free at capitalistbook.com. So we, we put a lot of it out for free. A lot of it is in like blog posts or you have the book for free? No, like you can actually, there's a little image where you can click through all the pages of the book on capitalistbook.com. Really? The thesis though is you're not actually, well, you're not, you're not actually buying the content. You're buying intimacy. Like yeah. you buy a Kindle or the book, you just explain why you buy them. Yeah. It's triggers or it's lighter on your shoulders when you travel. Like yeah. the content is out there, but the packaging is what people buy, the delivery. Hmm. And how does that fit in the grand, like grand scheme, you know, but like, how did that fit into your world outside of it? Like, are you going to do another book? Is this, was this like more top of funnel broad? Mm -hmm. Um, I know that you had the TV show and and unpack that for some people that are aware. Um, yeah. Cause like, that's why people are like, what do you think of Nathan? I'm like, dude, he's gonna win. I mm-hmm. mean, he's one of the best marketers out there, regardless how you believe of the approach. Yep. Cause I still, you know, I get it, but I don't think it's definitely not for me. Yep. Um, you know, if you continue to do this, like you're going to be a household name. Mm-hmm. How do you think of that in regards to the different projects you're working on? Um, so I can't tell you that I was intentional when I launched the book that I knew exactly what it was going to do for my brand. Mm-hmm. But here's what has actually happened. And the book came before the TV show. The book, yeah. So the order was podcast, uh, uh, book deal. Uh, was that YouTube buying taco truck thing? That was after the book That deal was before signed? the book deal. Yeah, because I felt like they were watching that. And yes. Yeah, so what that was, was I had seen Shark Tank, and I said, this is a massive hit. There should be like a facebook version of this. Mm. Let me take my phone and record myself walking down a street in a city, Austin, Texas, trying to, with my checkbook and pen, trying to buy a company Dude, was, on the spot. It's entertaining. So like two, I think 1.2 million people watched live, and I wrote this lady named Ming, a $6,000 check to buy her food truck uh, to relieve her Royalties loans. Royalties or, yeah. Yeah, she paid yeah. me back 75 cents per meal yeah. until I was paid back, and then 10 cents per meal in perpetuity. So I got like a 25% IRR on that deal. Uh, so it worked well, but the trick was there. I was proving again, we were in the middle but of the But it's jokey, because like I'm, I mean, you know, like finance, like it's not scalable, it's totally. high risk. Yeah, but it it's was, educational. Yes. Like it, Most people wouldn't even have known to ask the questions it, you've exactly. asked. Exactly, like the point there is not for, like I'm gonna make money on that. I sell sponsorships in the feed to Chase. Yeah, and, so even if you lost the capital yes. invested, didn't matter. Oh yeah, I had sponsors on that episode that okay. were spending way more than six grand. Yeah, it was like kind of total ca- yeah. deal price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, like I love playing board games that you've already engineered where you can't lose. Yeah. Those are fun board games to play, right, yeah. guys? You can't lose. Can't so lose. can't lose. Uh, but uh, I guess the point there was 
I shot that in the middle of negotiations with publishers when they were giving me a book deal kind of advances and proposals. So it was another thing for my agent to say, look, Nathan knows how to drive traffic. He just got a million views on this thing. And he was just a selfie shot video in Austin. So it was so leverage. It was part of the funnel yeah. to get the book deal. Yeah. Now people didn't know that no, watching it. Very strategic. Yeah. Yeah. Super strategic. Yeah. Like I didn't even know about like sponsors or anything. I was just like, man, he's just like mucking around. Yeah. No, it's a minute 11, 13 in that video on my Facebook page. You see me say Ming before I make a deal your food truck, I want to use my Chase card to try your Pad Thai Jesus. because I get 3x meal points on my Chase Preferred Reserve card. <laughs> That's the exact line, I swear. Eleven thirteen. Oh my gosh. Jared, is this good stuff uh, or what? Uh, David, this is works. hilarious. I just, I guess like, <laughs> so you, I mean, if, if people don't know, I mean, you're also like, you know, a founder, software guy, scaled, exited Heyo, mm -hmm. like, you know, and then I see you do these things and I mean, I'm personally like, why is he, why is he why fucking is he around doing this? Yeah, yeah, it's just so small, but I guess, it's that whole thing of like, it's a, like the longer you can go by being misunderstood, right? Cause that's Bezos. He's like, I'm okay being misunderstood. No, you never want to be understood. Then there's no open loop well, in the interviewer's heads. Well, congratulations, Nathan Lacka. Yeah. I'm still, yeah, you I'm always like, want people thinking about you, you want them wondering. If you resolve all the conflicts they have about understanding you, then no they don't think loops. about you. Exactly. You want to be misunderstood. Okay. You, you want everyone to always be guessing and wondering and, and talking to their friends. What do you think this guy's doing? What the heck does that mean? You want that. Well, congratulations because you're pulling it off. Because those are <laughs> these are all things I've always wondered when I see these. You know, we don't have enough time when we catch up to cover it all. The book has helped though, so you know this. I've just closed a fund, or it processed yeah. literally. You know, right now closing a fund. There have been so many LP people putting money and going. Nathan, like I was in the airport, like in the airport the other day, I saw your book on the bookshelf. Like it reminded me, yeah, I want in the fund. Like where do I wire the 200 grand, right? Yeah. I mean, top of mind awareness. Yes, or yeah. like founders will be like, yes, I want you to invest in my company or yes, I want to give you 2% advisor shares. Like you have a podcast and a mag, got your magazine you the other distribution. day. distribution. Yeah, I saw yeah, your magazine network. at the VC firm that I visited on their desk. Like they're reading your magazine. Like this stuff all kind of builds itself. How much of that was like uh, strategic versus kind of, it kind of connecting the dots looking back. Like mm -hmm. how much of it was like, this is what I'm doing for these reasons. Cause like what, again, going back to like the TV show is essentially you did the Facebook version of this, yeah. got the book deal. Yep. And then I guess what, what network? So a little secret on anyone trying to get on TV, um, TV production companies, their top of funnel is this back end private forum that book publishers publish their new like author deals. And so production companies will, the second that the, off, the the publisher, Random House, publishes, we just gave Nathan an advance. This is the working title. As soon as you get the like deal? As soon as we sign the deal with Random House. Not when it gets published Not publicly. when it gets published. Yeah, the yeah. The deal signed. The deal signed. Random House will post on this forum. Here's the working title. Because they want you to get on TV because... Yeah, they want they want that exposure. Yeah. But really, they use this forum to tell other publishers like just to stay up to date. Okay. But... TV folks like, will watch the titles, research the personalities behind the book, and then option rights to a TV deal. Why? Because they figure if somebody vetted the person to do a book deal that they're exactly. interesting or Especially have a story. if the advance was in the multiple six figures. Okay. Yeah. So I got, my point is on that day, I got like six inbound emails from production companies in New York saying, have you thought about, you know, TV? Tell me more about the book. And I'm, and then I got them all in a bidding war, basically. I put them all at a table in New York, big boardroom, 47th floor, and said, what ideas do you have? Here's the book co concept. And, uh, and then, I, I mean, in regards to, and you said we can talk about anything we talk about privately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what I find <laughs> fascinating is like, I don't know, I would be a little nervous shooting a friggin' Was it like reality TV? How much of it was scripted? What was the premise of the show? Oh, this was a battle, Dan. Like, they wanted to script it. And what was it? Explain to people what the show yeah, was. Yeah, so the working title was Latka, <clears throat> Latka's Million Dollar Road Trip. Okay, do you always want your name in yes. everything you do? Okay. 100%. Dude, you should write a book just on all this shit. You know how hard I had to I know, fight. but like, I think you you have so ninja level deep, like just the Some top. people just say, Nathan, you're just egotistical. You just, no, you just, you just shit your name again, everywhere. Again, if you don't know, you would assume that. <laughs> yeah. But I think if you understand the the, the principles. It, it all raises. Sense. It all okay. raises. Everything raises so each other. So it's called Latka? Million, Latka's Million Dollar Road Trip. Okay. And so I start with a suitcase of a million bucks in New York. I go across the country. I go into basically each city and I interview five companies. I walk in randomly to these companies on the street in the downtown. That's what you wanted to do? This is what they wanted to do. Okay. They wanted to script. They wanted to basically tell the people I was coming in. Ahead of time? Ahead of time. Okay. 
And this is, they do this because most people, oh, personalities shit, on TV, up, they couldn't they do it off they, the spot. They would just freeze. Yeah, yeah. They couldn't do it on the spot. Totally. When I, I see, like, when I watch, uh, you know, what's it? Um, <clears throat> Pro- the Prophet. The Prophet or, like, uh, to, uh, to the billionaire out of Aust- uh, Texas, the, the restaurateur. Oh, uh, yeah, Tellman. J- j- Tellman? J- j- is it Tellman? Oh, yeah, yeah. Tellman for, for Tito or so? I With the lobster. Uh, yeah, yeah, that guy. Yeah, yeah. So, like, when they're like, oh, very nice to meet you for the first time, like, there's no it's way not. you guys just met. Yeah. Like you See, met and then he went outside and you walked in. So you pick up on that stuff. I do too. And so I told the crew, I said, let me be vulnerable. Like I understand I'm going to embarrass myself. I'm going to walk into some of these places cold and they're going to say, get, get the, the hell out. out of here. And we need that on film. That's like authentic. And it made them more nervous than me. Right. Because you have to remember we had a crew of 30 people. I mean, there was they a crew need of to get 30. shot. Not only that there, you know, there's, there's two lawyers, 30 people. Yeah. There's two lawyers because it makes it look like not produced. Well, they're all, they're all behind. They're all behind the scenes. Yeah. But you have to remember the crew as we're going into random people, or I'm talking to a random person on the street after I move past them and they're filming lawyers have to go in and get release forms from every person, every I person, with. every person, even if they're in the background. So it's a ton of, and then there's the makeup crew. Do they pay these people for sign off? Who, who? The lawyers that try to get permission. Like what if somebody's like, no. Oh no, then the, we can't use the footage. You just blur it? Yeah. I've seen that. Some, oh, that's why you sometimes see this person was blurred. Yeah. These two other people are not. Yeah. They didn't want to sign the release. I got pretty good though at finding people on the street that I knew would be, would like, uh, you know, being on TV. You can kind of tell. Oh, you can tell. You can really tell, actually. It's yeah. pretty easy. Yeah. Um, so, no, I wanted the randomness. So, no, we shot in Denver. You know, they spent a million five uh, on the pilot shooting for a week in Denver. How many episodes? Uh, we shot two episodes. But here was the issue. So, so a million five on two episodes? Mm-hmm. Oh, I thought you a, shot like 10. No, dude, it's a different world from what we operate in. You know, we can oh, shoot no. a video. Yeah, it, iPhone. Two, three hundred yeah, yeah. bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that one I do with Ming at the food truck. Yeah. It was free. Just, yeah. And I'm like, why are you guys spending like seven fifty an episode? This is crazy. But you then you see the whole the thing. People. Yeah. Yeah. And that by the way, that whole business model is gonna get disrupted. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Cause it's so expensive. And so you shoot these two episodes, you did get the the real reactions. That you wanted? Oh, yeah, yeah. So what we did is a combination. Okay. So they basically said, Nathan, we don't think you're going to be able to walk into a random thing and get a deal done. We think we're going to waste a lot of time shooting and following and you're not going to be able to get it done. You said, And I said, well, it's about speed. I have to be able to get into enough places fast enough. Numbers game. So I would have to get into about maybe six. Maybe two would say get out or the cameras would intimidate. Because remember, I'm at a disadvantage when there's a crew with me. A phone's yeah, easy. Way easier. But like, there's 30 people. It's intimidating. Yeah. So I have to charm like the business owner when I walk in. I have to say something like, yeah, I know they got these big $20,000 cameras. Dude, they don't bite. So, you are, like I want, you're a charmer. Like <laughs> yeah. you know, you know exactly well, how to get some people, people like charm, but if you have a big ego, they actually will don't like charm. Like they the see farm weakness. one you did with the farmer, that old man? Yeah. That's a borderline because those old school guys, well, you they know, love you the look draw. Too, yeah, you look slick. Slick, city slicker. Yeah, so you got a, you got a Tom Ford yeah, suit you on the ranch. you got to yourself down a little yes. bit so you can, yeah. Yes, and I, I cheated a little in that episode because there's a lot of people, and this is true in startup world, where they, they, they don't allow themselves to be taught by people they want to be mentored by because they think they know everything. Okay, one sec. They don't allow them to talk by people they want to be mentored by? So let's say that I knew that you could do something for me. Dan Martell could do something for Nathan Latka. Yeah. And I know you're really good at product demos. Well, I think I'm pretty good at product demos, but I'm going to bluff like I'm not. And I might send you an email like, yeah, to like allow yourself Dan, to be mentored. Yes, yes, exactly. So like, and and then if you position that the right way, you will eventually that night go, Nathan asked amazing questions. I see a lot of myself in oh, Nathan. I'm, I'm, that's my go-to. It's like ask for advice on things, even if you already have the answer. 100%. So I felt if that's bad. their area of oh, expertise. So you did that with him. I felt bad in that episode. I didn't feel bad actually. I had to do it because he. What did was you a, ask him? About? He was an ex sheriff, and so my mom runs a dude ranch. So I'm a very I'm very good at roping. Okay, but you would never guess that I'm good at roping. So when we were chatting and he was sitting on his stool and there was a rope on the side of the. But cable. you could also talk to a certain degree of, at roping. So you'd be like, but I didn't. All you I didn't. All you literally I said, said, "Yo, what's that crazy all, thing?" All on I the says, wall? "Hey, looks like you have a rope and like there's a cow like." Rusty, you think you could teach me how to rope? And he's like, well, you know, well, we can, you see you know, yeah, I don't know. He's looking at me like, oh. yeah. And, and I'm like, okay, so what do I do with the rope? And I do it. And I, I, oh, and then it. he's all like, he's oh like, shit. And I got it the first time. He's like, skills. And I'm like, Rusty, you told me all the right things, man. Oh man. How many times has that happened? Nathan, wow. But like, that's yeah. an example of, like, I probably pushed it a little bit for yeah. the, the cameras there, yeah. but that is a real, real thing. 
And, and on that, when you're doing the show, how much of like, it's kind of like when you do video, you do need to go 20% more energetic. Like people meet me and sometimes they're like, sometimes they're like, fuck, you really are like this in real life. And other people are like, oh, I expected you to be all over the, like off the walls. Cause now, like, yeah, yeah, but because when you're on video, you do need, so how much of that comes into the show when you were doing that? Like that you were, well, this is why I didn't want it to be scripted. What, what sucks your energy doing reality TV is if you have to play a character that you're not. Because mm. everything you say, every motion you Dude, make. that makes so much sense, Yeah, man. see, if they just let me be naturally me, I can shoot for 20 hours That's a day. That's why when people are like, how are you not drained when you bash all this? Like, because it's natural for you. I'm, it's like, I don't have to think about it. It's like saying you got to think to talk to somebody. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, like now, if thinking, you had a producer saying, do right, this. Yeah, be, be this. tougher, sit up straighter, you know, you're too weak on these, whatever. Yeah. It, oh, interesting. So it's actually when you're too far away from just who you are and you have, that's the mental strain. Yeah. That's where you get fatigue or tired. Yeah. And by the way, this is true. This is a macro example of our whole world right now. With totally. Instagram, everyone is trying to be something, something that they're, they're not, not. And it's tiring. Yeah, it's tiring. They're less productive. They get more health issues. Yeah. They sleep less. Like people, you got it. The, the problem with us, you have to be comfortable with who you are. Yeah, be you. Totally. That's, Unapologetic. That's Unapologetic. interesting. So you do the show. You put time into it, and then the guy at, who was yeah. it, CNBC, NBC? So what we did is we the production company that we signed the deal with was called Cineflex. Mm -hmm. So we worked with them for many, many, many months kind of shooting this. Um, they got a bidding war going between a couple production companies. CNBC is ultimately who ended up buying the pilot. And they're known for financial type CNBC, uh, yeah. yeah. And by the way, I didn't really want to do a show. There was a one point where Bravo was really interested. Yeah. And I wouldn't have done it. Yeah. Because now does Andy so I, yeah. I watch that's my dirty secret. And, I watch and, The Housewives. How much don't, do you think don't how much judge do you think, me or I don't how much care, do you think I guess. Andy Cohen makes? But I don't even I, my question to you is, is he really the owner of Bravo or what does he do? No, he started off behind the camera and conceptualized kind of the reunion shows of Real Housewives, conceptualized a lot of the stuff and said, you know what? I can't find on air talent to create the drama that I need live, I'm going to get in front of the camera. This was many years ago. Okay, but he's not the owner of Bravo. Oh, no, no, no. But he's the, fa I mean, he's. Okay, but he's like every everybody on when he does the shows and he's interviewing, it all seems like Andy this. And like I called Andy when I was having this issue. Yeah. Like, no, the person you see on camera never owns this. It's like, look, well, that's why I was like, no, no, dude, no. it's Andy. Is he the owner of Bravo? Cause he's in all the shows and they talk about like, no, but he's he the is guy probably that, their highest paid talent. Okay. So he's just like Regis and Kathy Lee. Kinda. Totally. Okay. Yeah. Or Most any of your favorite do news not know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't even know what a modern like, Regis example and, is. Regis and Kelly. I was born in 89, Dan. I'm, I'm going like Kathy who, Lee, who, man. This isn't even Kelly. <laughs> or, or, yeah. Oh, or, yeah. Yeah, this is before. Exactly. You don't even know. Holy shit. But yeah, so the, the show the show went with CNBC. Um, I was signed I was signed with CA because my speaking business took off during this whole process. Yeah. Like I went from ten grand a thing to fifty grand and interviewing like Ashton Kutcher in Vegas and CA was doing yeah. all that stuff. Okay. So they negotiated a deal with CNBC. I got executive producer credits, which was great, plus an episodic. Why does that matter to get EP credits? On? Because it will then every time you're on the network, it, right at the beginning of the show, it will say produced by again name. Latka CNBC. Oh, that's why you see like Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, they negotiate for that. Yeah, EP credits. They want that because then if somebody else is thinking of doing a show and they're like, oh, he was involved in yeah. the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want credit for that kind and of that stuff. And that means it tells them that you were creative input to the to the yeah. show. And remember the core of the, what the show was, I came up with myself yeah, on Facebook, Facebook Live. Lives, yeah. yeah. So I really own like most of the idea and the rights. Um, and and uh, so anyways, we did it with CNBC. Jim Ackerman, who was the president of CNBC at the time, was the internal buyer, buy-in. Yeah. He was unfortunately, uh, you know, released or walked away recently. So my deal essentially went with that, just like product sales. Yeah. Right? You got to need two or three internal buy-ins. <laughs> So yeah. it wasn't a horrible situation because this was the big draining thing that you might not appreciate or people might not appreciate. For one episode, one 47-minute episode, which is an hour-long thing because of yeah. Commercials, yeah, commercials, it took five days shooting essentially 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. to produce no 47 shit. minutes of produced content. Really? Compare that to how you and I batch podcasts and escape velocity. Wow. It's not efficient. It's not, it's not efficient, but it's probably more efficient than it used to be because like, you know, they're, they're, especially with a reality show versus like a stage show and da, 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 da. Yep. Um, let's talk about disrupting startup finance. Let's do it. Yeah. Cause like, 
I mean, this is a thing that I love about you, Nathan, is that when you, when you, when you find a thing, you go deep, you like, it's, I mean, we were hanging out poolside at an event and all of a sudden you pulled out like a bunch of term <laughs> sheets and like spreadsheets and you're like, yeah, here's I've what studied I'm them. <laughs> Dude, highlighted, dog-eared. I'm like, wow, like there's people, you know? Um, so talk about what's changing, uh, cause this feels like an entertainment podcast or a thought leadership <laughs> podcast, but like. Uh, in regards to SaaS funding, you know, there's definitely been this this migration in the landscape with revenue based financing, yep. and like there's always been Silicon Valley Bank, but you know, it's you're not venture backed, you're really not talking to them. They, you know, they're de like it's not really risky capital because they know the players and who's yep. going to fund the next rounds. But um, with SaaS, there's such an incredible predictable model behind it. Um, there's some new players, some new options. How do you see those? and like the true thoughts of it, and you yeah. can name them if you want. Yeah, uh, of course. And then what's your perspective to what you want to bring to the market? So ultimately what I'm trying to do is help founders get cheaper capital. Mm. And so there are essentially six forms, like literally six financial vehicles founders can get money on. Yeah. The most expensive is equity, yeah. right? Uh, then under that, I would say you have- And equity means they're, they're giving you money for a percent of company. shares in your company. Yes, and this is typically in the form of a convertible note or YC yeah. safe or things like that, or a priced round directly, yeah. meaning they put an equity value immediately. Yeah. It's not it's not debt. Right under equity, I would say you have these new form of kind of seals, shared earnings income agreements. And okay. these and what this means is okay. What's interesting is all this stuff has existed in other yes. industries. It's just we're just now coming, now into, coming SaaS. into SaaS. Yeah. That's why when people go, Nathan, how do you go with this? I'm like, this is not new stuff. No, it's I mean there's a reason why like it's called a seal, because like this is what they call it in other yeah. industries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Real mean Real estate. SaaS is just new. Yeah. So it hasn't brought all the old models in. Yeah. But all a shared earnings income agreement is is essentially, Dan, I'll write you a hundred thousand dollar check into your company right now. Uh, for ten percent of the business, you have the right over the next ten years to buy back my hundred thousand dollars for three hundred grand. So I get a three extra. So this is my NDVC, money. NDVC, Tiny, Tiny C, C, Earnest Capital. Earnest, yeah. Some mixture of yeah. This. Some of them have different things. They have value add. They have yep. different terms. But it looks like that. Some Where essentially, you have the you ability. Repay. Yeah, you you have the ability to buy back the equity. Essentially, well, some of sometimes I forget who it is, and I don't get this wrong. So I'm just going to say, look it up. One of them forces you okay. to repay Near, back within 3X. five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah. So it, it can be exp like again, founders don't know how to evaluate these because each dimension has a different impact to total cost of capital. Correct. Yeah. yeah. You know, equity you don't have to pay back. Yeah. But it's more expensive. Debt yeah. you have to pay back. But they don't expenses. even know how to run the numbers. It's hard. Yeah. Because they're like really difficult. Yeah. You're assuming you're going to be successful. What degree? It's, but it's, it's, it, on all forms, are we ranking these as the most expensive, second most yeah, expensive? Yeah, equity is the most expensive. Okay, let's assume. If you're successful. Let's, let's assume this. Let's assume million you're outcome. watching right now, you're a million dollar ARR company, yeah. and, in, and in five years, you sell for $10 million. Yeah. So I'm talking like, yeah, pretty, you know, this is pretty hitter. safe. Yeah. This is yeah, yeah. kind of a, not a billion, yeah. not a crazy thing, yeah. not a bankrupt thing. Yeah. Million now, you sell for 10 million. Equity is going to be your most expensive. You raised a million. Well, let's say you raised, I don't know, a million bucks and you sold 10% of the company. You sell for yeah. 10 million. That's worth obviously yeah. a million. So, um, so obviously that math wouldn't work, but yeah. you get the point. Equity is yeah. most expensive. Under that, you have a seal. Under that, you have what's called an RBF, revenue-based financing. And all that means is, hey, Dan, uh, I'll give you up to 6X your current MRR right now. So if you're doing a so million- So let's just go back to seal real quick because the equity is pure money in. I own a percentage. Yep. When you sell, I get a, a proportionate to that percentage. Yep. Seal is money in. If you decide not to sell, you still got to pay it back or-, or you can, there's four different forms. Yeah, you can there's choose four, to pay it back. Yeah. You can choose to leave it as equity. Yeah. And one of them forces you to start paying it back. There's a repayment start Okay, date. so their unique thing is maybe the valuation is better. Or the equity they're asking for is smaller. Well, they're, I would say their value is actually optionality. You can okay. choose as a founder, do you want to treat it like debt or do you want to treat it like equity, depending on how your business okay, does. Okay, so if you decide instead of just doing a 10 million base hit, you want to go for 100 million, you can buy them out because you know that's going to be worth more. At you the got end it. Day. Look at Wistia. Okay. Right? Perfect. How they raise yeah. money to buy out the debt. debt. Yeah. Now, that debt was not on a seal, but yeah. the idea of that concept, giving the founders that option on day one when the money's put in, that's essentially what's happening. Okay. We'll come back to those because this is, this is, okay, cool. Equity then, debt yeah. seal. Yeah. RBF revenue based financing. Yeah, which is which is fascinating. There's enough data in the market. We can create some kind of trend line predictability. Of course. Yep. And uh, based on that, we're willing to lend you five X MRR, six X MRR monthly recurring revenue so that you essentially can defer maybe if you're instead of doing a, a, an equity round, you can defer it, get some more scale. It's 
Yeah. It's great because yeah. it doesn't hit your, it doesn't dilute you at all. Yeah. Right. So uh, let's same example, million dollar company today. Yeah. Let's say you grace $500,000 on a, on a RBF. Yeah. Uh, you will then pay that back typically between 1.3 and 1.6 X repayment cap. Okay. So somewhere between call it, um, you know, 900 grand and a million two on yeah. the 500 and you will pay that back over a three to six year period. Okay. Uh, and so that's, so the IR on the, like, what's that cost? Yeah. Well, so that's the pure, just, that's yeah. just the pure repayment cap, but there's other things like an advance fee. So when they advance the 500 grand, sometimes they'll charge 1.5% to the 500. So there's fees, there's fees. And then you're paying it back on a percent of gross revenue each month between mm -hmm. four and 9% of your monthly gross revenue. Yeah. Do you have this online somewhere? Yeah. It's okay. all you can, it's uh, so just Nathan. look up like, no, you can just Google venture debt cost to capital. Okay, perfect. And they'll give you like a comparison. Yeah, you'll see my article, but you'll see a lot of other yeah, people venture, commenting. Yeah, venture debt cost capital. Yeah. So anyways, to get to bring build out the full thing again, you, you've got equity is the most expensive. You've got seals the second most. You've got RBF, which is kind of the third, uh, sorry, the third cheapest. Yeah. Under that, you've got mezzanine debt. And all mezzanine debt is, is a combination of debt plus uh, uh, warrants. 0.5 to like 1% of the company. Okay. Which is what they're usually warrants. Okay. Right. And then the least expensive. But you got to be at some level of you have to be scale. more than 5 million, 10 million AR. Yeah. Cause they're stuff. like, we want a track record. Yeah. 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 So it's, you can't get a loan from the bank or it's a special bank that likes to do yeah, this is like SAS capital. Kind and of it's only because the they create like people need to understand, like in the finance world, they're able to do this cause they have a portfolio approach. They do a lot of these. Yep. So that like people get pissed. They're like, why won't my bank do this? It's like your bank may not specialize in this, you know, financial instrument. Well, Whereas, banks don't know how to value MRR as an asset. That's a whole nother. Yeah. yeah banks can't. That's why yeah. this is taking off is banks can't touch SaaS companies. There's no physical collateral. Dude, one of my good buddies just raised, I think he did uh, a debt round from a bank in Canada, like mm -hmm. a real, like they beat out SVB because they were saying CIBC. It was Bank of Montreal. Oh yeah. You told me about this. Yeah. 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 So that's cool that that's they're great. saying, hey, we don't want to lose the business. This is great for entrepreneurs. Yeah. Right. Because like this whole space, debt lending is going to be a race to the bottom. Whoever mm -hmm. builds the largest loan book, loaning to software companies, cheapest. will bring down the cost. And if they're a good person and they care about founders, they will pass the savings off to founders. Yeah. So you know right now, I'm about to do a deal with an intro that you made for me. Yep. And that particular CEO, I told him, you know, I'll loan you the money at a cheap rate. And I said, every CEO you bring me that I loan more money to, I'll knock a percent interest off both of your pavements. You're like, oh, both you're your doing the Dropbox cheap. model. Yes, in lending. Wow. Do you think that's sustainable or is that just now? No, to it's see hugely it? sustainable. Because I, the re only reason I can do this is because I've got about 3,000 SaaS companies that have connected their bank to my back end. Okay. So I can do real regression analysis and basically have a credit score to SaaS companies to predict their default risk. Okay. So I can bring down the cost of capital because of the confidence I have in the ARR stream, net revenue retention of greater than 130%, yeah. CAC is low, right? T team is really strong. They're older than five years old. Even if they're bootstrapped, I can still do these deals. Okay. Um, so you said there were six? Yeah. Of, so you've yeah. got mes debt and then senior, senior debt. And what is that? Senior debt is SVB, right? Okay. Or, or square one. They will, they will give you, if you've raised 10 million from VC, yeah. they'll come in and give you a $2 million line, $3 million line on top of that. Our friend David at Grasshopper, yeah. right? Did that before the exit to juice some stuff, yeah. but you can get that, but you can only get that if you've already Have gone on the VC debt. track. Yeah. See, I think there's an opportunity to give like million dollar SaaS or $2 million bootstrap SaaS CEOs funding. So they never have to go the VC route. They keep their whole company. Yeah. Now the seal, I just want to come back to that. It sounds like if you're a founder, do you think seal makes sense? It, it almost sounds like this is maybe what you do when you don't know what you want to do. Exactly. That's okay. why there's only, so to give you a sense of which of these uh, vehicles are most popular, there's only been about 20 million total deployed in all time on seals into SaaS. Wow. Versus, versus ventures, it's got to be billions. Billions. Yeah. yeah. Billions on the equity side. Yeah. Mezzanine. Billions. Hundreds of, yeah, yeah. Hundreds of millions, if not billions, probably on the, so seal is the smallest asset class. Okay. There's been about 280, 290 million on RBFs. Yeah. Across the major players, lighter capital, SaaS capital, espresso, but espresso started as shred financing. We can talk about that later if you yeah. want. But um, yeah, there's different paths for them to get into the the financial thing. And then even within, from a terms point of view, I mean, it's there's warrants, there's 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 the the, the pit, like I mean, there's just it's hard to evaluate. But you're saying some people have done the deep digging to say here's the true cost of capital for each different one. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I've done a ton of digging on. Well, this. dude, you had like all just the term printed sheets. off, printed yeah. off, read through it, figured out like how this 
this would map out? Yeah, that's because a lot of these folks have actually paid me for deal flow over the okay. past couple of years. So I've actually helped them build their own loan team. I've helped founders raise from them. I've been in the term sheet negotiations. So I see all the gotchas. Mm -hmm. And I feel like these guys, honestly, some of the providers, they're just, the cost of capital is 25, 26% IRR. It's egregious. I mean, you should be lending to some of these CEOs. You could go. You I don't mean, think the default rates justify that? Um, no, I think what happens is you've got a company like Lighter Capital, which has 50 people on their headcount, and they just moved to the new offices in Seattle. That's expenses. How Super do you think they expensive. pay for the expenses? They got to charge higher interest rates to cover their overhead. Yeah, I'm a one man show, so I can pass all the savings on to founders. But does that mean, and I know you have the data, does that mean you're doing less due diligence that, that maybe they are? Uh, no, because most of their headcount is not underwriters. They spend most of their time marketing, sales. Uh, they have people, you know, spending, uh, spending up Facebook events. ads, going to events, sponsoring yeah. booths. Like I've got all that kind of taken care of already because the brand. Yeah. So no, I'm doing a lot of due diligence. When someone gives me like their bank account access and all, I mean, I'm taking all historical data. I'm printing out almost 450 charts. And then I mean, ClearBank's doing this for e-commerce ClearBank's companies. doing this for e-commerce. Yep. The most sophisticated software backend I've seen for analyzing SaaS companies, and frankly, it's not that sophisticated, is, is Andreessen. What, they have a model where you connect and then they do some analysis. They don't connect it, but they basically have the best note taking system from their analysts on companies in Salesforce. It's not true real API access data. Okay, just just good information. Just good information. Yeah. Huh. Where do you, I mean, where do you see if you were starting a SaaS company today, what what would you focus on? What are the Dan, I would never start a SaaS company today. No, we've I know talked we've talked about, about this. this. Yeah, we're buying. <laughs> um, you go buy. So we buy. What What's the characteristics of a company from your perspective? What What would you be looking for in regards to highest ROI, least amount of effort? Yep. Not, not that there's no effort, but just like, you know. I'd fly as far as possible away from, from San any, Francisco yeah, and New anything York. Anything that's going to get covered on TechCrunch. Yep, anything yeah. on TechCrunch. I'd go to the middle of the country somewhere. Yeah. I'd look at Farm farmers. Tech. Yeah. Waste. Yeah. Uh, anything people do every day, they throw away stuff. Maybe okay. They they like poop. So like look at yeah. like bathroom related stuff. But there's all kinds yeah, of they software. Eat. They eat. They lock their doors. There's software for they that. Consume right? alcohol. They consume alcohol. Yeah. Look yeah. at what people do. A lot of. They drive. They drive, and then figure out is what's is their subscription business already there where they don't know how to actually run a subscription business. They kind of fell into when it. When we say subscription business, you mean a SaaS to the businesses that support. Yeah, I should industry. say I should. Yeah, because I'm thinking I should box. say monthly recurring. Yeah, monthly like, recurring yeah. payments. Subscri I thought you were doing a subscription box. I was yeah, no, 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 no. Sorry, monthly recurring, like a waste management company in the middle of the country. Could you yeah. imagine you on a waste and management what about company? You grow the hell out of that. Crush it. Yeah, yeah. Um, what What would ACVs look like? What would the go to market look like? What do you like? Is it mid market? I think most of your value doing that kind of thing is actually finding an unsexy market and getting the deal done. I mean, because all the other stuff is table stakes. Like, you know what the optimal ACV is if you want a field sales team. Yeah. Like, you know what you got to get churned down to to get a 6x valuation multiple when you sell your company to yeah. Salesforce. Like, we know, everyone knows these things, but executing them is different. Yeah. And I think you get, it's kind of like when you buy real estate, they say you, you make your money when, when you, buy. you buy. Yeah. I think same thing in SaaS. Yeah. So you just look for the right opportunity. Yeah. What's, what's the, what's the next, you know, 16 months look like for you? Obviously building the loan tape to a billion dollars yep. is the vision. Yep. Um, how does the media empire you've built support that? What are you working on? Yeah, I mean, everything. And that is I, a magazine, that was an experiment. Are you going to keep doing it for? Oh, yeah, we ship now about 10000 a month. But you said, I'm going to promise to do it for a year I'll or two keep years. Doing it. It's profitable. Okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. so you're going to keep doing the magazine. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're okay. making money on it. All right, cool. We're making money on a magazine. I know, but it's just How like. How crazy is that? Know, opportunity costs, like, do you want to do other stuff? Is it something? Well, no, the magazine basically writes itself. It's, it's just an gen. export of the data. Yeah. And the text is a transcription of podcast episodes. Yeah. It's, it's not a ton of work to put together. Okay. It's just a different form factor. Yeah. It's the same way you cut these up, yeah. right? Like Instagram, yeah. Twitter, it. repurpose, yeah. exactly. Okay. Uh, but no, I mean, literally all I am focused on is, my thing is I have too much deal flow from SaaS founders. Mm -hmm. It's literally, I'm, most of my meetings have been with like bankers and stuff trying to figure out who's gonna write me the $100 million check after I deploy this first $5 million fund that I've raised. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, my main thing is figuring out who are the right partners coming as LPs, how to make sure I deploy the capital in a smart way, mm -hmm. and then just scale that up as fast as I possibly can, all right, to, you know, a billion, two, three so billion dollar loan book. 
throughput. In the center there. Yeah, and think of velocity, yeah. speed. I want to build it where a founder can go to a website, click a button, and get a loan from me instantly. And I've done amazing due diligence in 30 seconds or less yeah. because of all the, the analysis I do on the banking data. Where I mean, where can people find you online? All over the podcast, et cetera. <laughs> where would you like them to go right now? What's the thing you want to push the most right now? I mean, I'm going to guess your audience is mostly going to be interested. It's a, SaaS. And, yeah, SaaS. Yeah. How do I get capital the cheapest? And so I would really recommend that that article I wrote. Just search Latka Venture Debt because there's a big Excel file at the top of it with all the venture debt players and their cost of capital. Oh, you've got this already done you up. Can, yeah, you can go down it with how links many, to all their term sheets. I'd say there's about 50 main players. 50? That participate in that stack we talked about. Sealed yeah. down. Dude, the I'll, I'll link it up in the description. I think I that's going to be the most valuable for your folks. Well, it's what I wanted to. So I asked you. So I mean, if you've got that, we'll link it up. Yeah, um, Nathan, I appreciate it, man. We're going to do round two. Boom! You do so much stuff. Thanks, man. Uh, we'll catch up. I appreciate you. Man. Appreciate you, Dan. Thank you. Thanks for watching this episode of Escape Velocity. Be sure to like and subscribe, and leave a comment with your biggest insight from our conversation. Be sure to check out the next episode.